All right, uh, good morning. How many people, I asked this earlier on Amplified, how many people here have had their code be attacked by zombie pointers? I had a couple people say earlier. All right, uh, did you have to burn them or was uh, you know uh, running away sufficient uh, stake through the heart? How'd that work? How many people had to burn them? Nobody burned them. Stake through the heart? Uh, pork loin through the heart? Oh, well, anyway. Uh, anyway, so uh, we're going to talk about the perils of uh, Lifetime in Pointers app. And I, I got some heat from my co-presenters for having boring slides in the initial round, um, and they gave me some things to choose from. I eventually picked the thing in the upper middle, but doctored it up a little bit in GIMP. So uh, that's where that came from. So our story starts uh, in 1973, back when dinosaurs walked the Earth. There's a guy named Smith and Brown, whose names will live forever, although perhaps not attached to them. Uh, and they mentioned, they didn't say they invented it, they just mentioned a last and first out stack push algorithm back uh, on an IBM 370 written in business assembly language back in 1973. And as far as I know, this is the simplest known concurrent algorithm that survives um, zombie pointers or is designed to deal with zombie pointers. Uh, we don't know when this was invented. We just know that it was sometime prior to 1973. So if you're an aspiring software archaeologist, here's an opportunity for you. Go back and dig it up. You might find a zombie, though, so be careful. Oh, by the way, the dinosaurs still walk the Earth. Uh, we call some of them ostriches. Uh, uh, given how uh, much uh, scorn was heaped on people that said that people and dinosaurs walked the Earth when I was a small kid, I find this very, uh, very humorous. Uh, apologies if it's lost on the newer people in the crowd. In any case, uh, coincidentally, in 1973, I programmed my first computer. But uh, unlike, it wasn't a fancy new 370. It was an old, crufty 360 in a community college about 14 miles from where I lived. And as far as I know, that's the closest computer to where I lived, or was at the time. Uh, it was a high school class. Um, and uh, this did involve both punch cards and Fortran. And uh, for some reason, they didn't see fit to teach us either concurrency or C++. I, I still don't know why. But uh, despite that, and uh, you know, it was one of these things that uh, I wasn't that sold on computers initially. You know, they gave us these toy problems. They were usually involved some kind of a math problem. So you punch this stuff on cards, you get syntax errors, you have bugs, you chase them, and it's kind of like, you know, I could have solved this in a tenth of the time just with paper and pencil, thank you. But everybody was saying the computers were important, so I figured, okay, I'll take the class next year because no matter what, I need to know about them. If people are just gonna use these things stupidly, uh, I need to know what the weaknesses are so I can figure out when not to use them, right? Uh, so I expected to walk back in that machine room my junior year. I was wrong. Uh, my high school got a leased line, 110 baud, with an ASR 33 teletype, you know, rattly bang thing, paper tape, you know, the latest stuff back then. Uh, and it was a computer that uh, was a basic computer, the basic language. So that's what we did instead. Um, in fact, not only did I not use that 360, in my junior year. I wasn't going to program for a 360 for another almost 30 years. And when I did, the operating system I would use wasn't going to be started for more than 15 years. Despite my lack of foreknowledge, somewhere in Finland, a small boy was growing up. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at this uh, uh, simple algorithm. I have two slides here. This is mostly the types and list empty. So, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I got some heat. I presented this thing in SG1, uh, C++ SG1 committee a few months ago and got some heat for not having, you know, for, for, for having it in C++ when the original obviously couldn't have been in C++. I offered to present it next time in business assembly language and they, for some reason, didn't think that was appropriate either. So uh, I'll stick with C++ for the moment. Okay, so we have a template. We got a type name. Uh, we have to have nodes we're pushing on the stack. And they just have the value, whatever type you want. They have a next pointer, and they have a constructor. Uh, we have a list empty, which uh, is just there. That's what you'd expect. Is the, list, is the top null or not? Uh, we obviously have to have a top pointer that uh, heads the list. So that's pretty straightforward. And then we have a couple of functions. We have list push. We have list pop all. And this may seem a little strange. We do not have a list pop. We could. It's just that it would make it more complicated. This Algorithm is very, very simple, uh, at least for a concurrent algorithm. If you only push one at a time, and when you pop, you take the whole list. So that's what we're doing. So the push is pretty straightforward. We allocate a new node. We set its pointer to the top. And then we sit in a loop doing compare exchange. 
Now, one of the cool things about compare and exchange is that um, it fills in the old pointer with the, with the wrong value, with the actual value if you get it wrong, if you guess wrong. So you can just have a blind loop spinning on it. You don't have to reload each time. So that's all there is to it, uh, four lines of code. Allocate, initialize, compare exchange till you succeed. Pop all is even simpler, really. The business part of this algorithm of pop all from a concurrency viewpoint is that single line where it doesn't exchange. We put a null pointer in there and harvest whatever the list is. One operation, guaranteed to succeed, although if you have uh, a certain kinds of, you know, if you have LLSC type of CPU underneath, there's still going to be a retry loop perhaps. But if you have an exchange instruction, one instruction gets done, you got it. And the loop, all the loop is doing is uh, making sure we get the next pointer. And then it calls whatever function was passed in on whatever value was there. And then it deletes the element and then traverses to next. So that's all there is to it. With this, we have a concurrent set of, cl a concurrent class that can push elements onto a list, onto a stack, if you will, and it can pop the contents of the stack. And it's safe concurrently. If you push something, it will be pop all eventually. You don't ever pop all anything twice, and so on and so forth. Any questions on the types or the algorithm before I go into the just kind of showing how it works in some simple cases? Hearing, no, oh, yes, go ahead. The third line in the, in the uh, push function? Okay, so we're doing, we're taking top. So remember the top is the, for this class, is the pointer to the beginning of the stack. Okay, and we're using the member function, compare exchange weak. And new node narrow next is the value we expect that pointer to have because we just loaded on the previous line. So we picked up the top pointer, we put it in the next right up there, and then we pass it to compare exchange, and it's going to atomically say, hey, is the top pointer equal to new node next? If it is, it's going to say, great, stick new node there. Okay. If it fails, if it fails, there's an extra step that isn't always in in a compare exchange, all right? If it fails, and say, oh, it failed, so we'll take the actual value that didn't match, and we're going to store it into new node next. Okay, which means when we come back around the loop, we'll have already done essentially that top load line. So the compare, the compare and exchange is doing that top load, that assignment for us each time through the loop, which is kind of convenient, uh, but a little obscure. Is that, does that help? Okay, any other? Yeah. Why is there no memory order? And was the original algorithm the equivalent of switch existence? Um, the original uh, mem thing would have been uh, TSO plus... Um, multi-copy atomic, which is what 370 was. So a little bit stronger than uh, x86. OG. Yeah. I'm sorry? OG. Yeah, it still is a little stronger. Although I'm not sure how, much use, how many use cases there are for multi-copy atomic with the <laughs> where x86 would give you the wrong answer. Go ahead. Uh, hold that question. The question was, does this code have any ABA problems? And that is, that's an excellent question. Give me about a few slides and we'll get there. Okay, with that, let's go take a look. Uh, that's a great prompt. Thank you. Uh, let's go take a look at a couple of use cases just to see if this is really, if we're really uh, doing something useful. Yeah, really. <laughs> and uh, why are we not uh, doing anything here? Oh, because I've got managed to get myself focused over there. So if I do that, look at that. What do you know? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a couple of threads that are both going to list push at the same time. And we're going to start with an empty stack. So we just have the top pointer there, it's null. We're going to do a couple list pushes. So uh, the, the guys doing list pushes, each of them is going to allocate something. And one of them has an A it's pushing, the other has a B it's pushing. And they executed those two lines, each of them, those two lines, they allocated and they initialized. And they picked up the, uh, the top pointer, which is null. And so both of them have their A and B with a null pointer now. Okay, the next thing they're gonna do is they're both going to do that compare exchange weak. Well, the way compare exchange works, one can succeed, the other has to fail. It could be that both could fail, but I decided to be not that cruel and not waste a slide. So um, we'll say that uh, the, the one A1 uh, succeeded and then B lost, it failed. And in that case, the new state is shown in the middle. So we have top pointing to B. And remember the compare and swap, that was the question earlier. 
The compare and swap took B and stored its next pointer to the new value of top, which is A. So now we're sitting there with top pointed A, that's the stack, and we got the other thread ready to retry to push itself on, which is gonna do. No competition, by default it wins, it succeeds. Um, it could have failed spuriously again, but I wasn't that cruel. So, as a result, the new state is like shown on the far right there. So we've got, and, and, and it's interesting in this one, the guy that won ends up at the end of the list. So sometimes, you know, the, the good guys finish first, I guess, or something, or what, I don't know. But uh, draw whatever morals or immorals you want out of that, it's your choice. In any case, so we're done. Uh, we've gone through this algorithm. We successfully pushed both elements on the list. They've shown up in some order. No ordering is, of the two elements is guaranteed because they're concurrent. And there we are. All right, well, that's fine. But how about racing pop all? So let's start with the state on the right. And then we're going to have both pop alls go concurrently on that same state. So again, we have that state. We're going to do some pop alls. So that means both threads are going to do an exchange. They're going to exchange null pointer into the list. They're going to get back the list in their local variable p. Right now, they haven't done that yet, so their local variable p's are whatever garbage they were. So they do the exchange, and let's just say b wins this time, okay, just to keep things even. Not that a computer's ever going to keep things even, just in case you're curious, but we, we're human, we can do that. And uh, we have the list there. Um, a question you might have at this point, I've been talking about zombies, is where's the zombies? We've gone through two examples so far. No zombies, where are they, right? <laughs> All right, you guys could be patient, I guess. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have to do a little more complicated example. Uh, unlike the movies, here you have to do a little more work to make the zombies appear. Uh, in the movies, they kind of show up uh, even though you're trying to prevent them, I guess. Um, you know, although I haven't watched all the zombie movies, maybe there's some that have, where you have to do extra incantations or something, I don't know. Um, so anyway, we're gonna assume a simple compiler. So maybe you have a dash capital O int mat min or something like that, or maybe you, uh, you know, are writing an assembly language like Smith and Brown were doing back in 1973. But in any case, this time we're starting with a new example. So we have A and then B on our stack. And uh, task A is going to push a new element C. Concurrently, task B is going to do a pop all, and then it's going to push D, all right? So task A is going to do just one thing, it's going to push C. Task B is going to do two things in order, it's going to pop all, and then it's going to push D. Okay, that's not too complicated an incantation, so be careful. Zombies take some work to appear here, but not as much as you might think. All right, so we start off, task A pushes C. So it does its allocation, it initializes the thing, gets the next pointer set up, and it's like there, all right? And then uh, um, it gets stuck. Maybe there's an interrupt. Maybe it's in a, a, a guest OS and the vCPU gets preempted. Who knows? But in any case, it's stuck there for a while. No fault of its own, computers can do that anytime they want for whatever reason. Never assume, never, ever assume any kind of common speed. Or, or limitation on speed for using road code, even for kernel code. You will get bitten, all right? So this could happen. Guy could start through his algorithm and just get stuck for a while. So now the next task, the other task, he's gonna do is pop all. And uh, I guess, I'm sorry, I kinda double hit that there. He does his pop all. So he gets the list. The list is now empty and the C pointer still points to A. And that's kind of okay at this point because it's valid and it's there. But what task B is gonna do now is go through that loop, calling that function, and deleting everybody. And after it gets done doing that, we have what's called an invalid pointer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> good timing, uh, good sound effects. Um, did, which of you guys planned that? <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we got this invalid pointer. Uh, it points to the free list, and that's kind of a bad idea, as some of you may have learned the hard way. Um, but so far, there's no harm done because the guy's stuck off getting a pizza or whatever he's doing anyway. He's not doing any useful work. But um, what's going to happen is task B is going to take the next step. Remember, task B was going to pop all and then do a push of D. So it's going to do an allocate which may give it the thing it freed, 
And that's why we got the dotted line around A and that dotted arrow. I mean, it's, it's not really in both places at once. We're just demonstrating the fact it was on the free list and now he's got his local variable he's filling with D. And we still have that invalid pointer, which is pointing now to something of the right type. Um, but still, if you do this, um, a lot of bad things can happen. So the next thing that's gonna happen is that it's gonna push it on the list, like that. And if you remember, that's exactly the same configuration we had several slides back just before task A paused, except that the pointer is colored red. But it's pointing to the same address. Remember I said, uh, you know, dash capital O, some large negative number, or writing an assembly, or we have a very simple compiler or something. All the addresses are perfectly fine, you know? Um, if you looked in memory, it'd look okay, but C++ and C aren't happy about this. Okay, so now let's just say that, uh, so it's done this, and now let's say that uh, task A finally gets done with its pizza or whatever it's doing, and it's gonna make progress again. Well, it completes its push. The compare exchange weak succeeds. The bits are the same. Compare exchange is uh, defined to operate on bits, not on pointers as such. And so we have a zombie pointer now. From an assembly language viewpoint, it's just fine, but by the standard, we have a problem. Of course, Smith and Brown were writing in assembly language, so, you know, they're perfectly fine and off the hook. The question is, this, is, this actually is a useful algorithm. It shows up in a bunch of places. How do we write it today in such a way that it actually works? The thing is, you got that compare and swap in there. If the pointer really did point to the free list, there's no way, unless you really have a problem, that the compare and swap should succeed. The only time it should succeed is if somebody has, and this gets back to the ABA question from, from several slides ago. When we have ABA, it's for this algorithm, in a semi-language, that's just fine. The only way we get an ABA thing is if something's been freed, reallocated, reinitialized, put back on the list, and everybody's happy. Um, except that we use compilers these days and have interesting standards. All right, so how did we get here? I mean, this has been, this, this zap, a pointer, uh, the object lifetime in pointer zap's been around for a long time. I mean, uh, it, the 1989 C standard has words to that effect, kind of. In 1998, C++ standard took the C aspects of that and said, yay, barely, and then there was defect report 260 in the C committee, and they said, uh, yes, yes, we really mean this eventually, after some screaming and shouting. And then finally, in 2011, C and C++ finally gained concurrency. So, you know, this is, this lifetime in pointer zap is a really long-held tradition. How many people were born in 1989? Yeah, maybe half. Okay, so you get the idea, right? Um, yeah, so the thing is, though, In my book, people writing standards are supposed to pay attention to existing practice, okay? They didn't. <laughs> well, there's, there's several things that play into this. There's some excitement in the C committee, and I think it, I think it touched in C++ last meeting, a little bit in Cone, um, on provenance. And these are slightly different concepts. I'm not, gonna, I'm not talking about provenance. Um, one way to think of it is that pointer zap is where you know there's been a free, or you know there have to have been a free, and then all pointers are this thing that's been, or, or it could be something going out of scope. One way or another, an object's lifetime has ended. When that lifetime ends, all the pointers to it, wherever they are, whatever CPU they are, however they're located, suddenly become zombies. Uh, provenance, um, there are a lot, it's difficult to, I'll just give an example. I'll give kind of uh, a rough definition by example. Provenance is where you do a couple of news and then you know the pointers can't be the same because they came from different news would be one way of thinking about it. There's other subtleties. And uh, reading Peter Sewell's papers and his group's papers is very educational. I need to read them again, actually. Okay, but we're talking about zombie pointers here right now. We're not worried about provenance. This example, by the way, has problems both with zombie pointers and with provenance but right now I'm just focusing on the zombie pointers. Okay, one point is that with something like this, you know, we could put in the library, and then, you know, the library doesn't have to be written in the standard, okay? 
the library can be written by somebody that knows what the implementation does and knows that things are okay or puts the right incantations or whatever they do to make it all work. Um, and uh, that's fine for this algorithm. That actually is a reasonable resolution for this particular algorithm because all you're doing is getting values back. You're putting values in. All this pointer stuff is underneath the covers and never affects the user. Except that I picked this example not because it's representative, but because it's the simple ex simplest example I know of that involves concurrency and zombie pointers. Here's a few others. There are more. All right. Um, and uh, the, uh, and I've gotten, whoa, look at that. It's just being slow. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, uh, rather than go through these, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand the stage over to Magid. And he's going to talk about hazard pointers. And hazard pointers uh, has an example that uh, will help things out here a bit. Okay. Mike. Right. Thanks, Paul. Um, so just want to show a different example. And also, it has different characteristics from the LIFO push example. Uh, just very briefly about hazard pointers, it's basically uh, there are readers who are trying to protect um, like in this example, we have a, a root or a source pointing to a, a dynamic block, and readers want to be able to read that block even when it is being replaced and potentially want to be reclaimed by uh, a concurrent updater. So in, in they, they, they set a hazard pointer. They, it's a single writer, multi-reader. Uh, that's, that's what a pointer. Uh, they set the hazard pointer to, that, to point to that uh, block, and then they check that was it still there? It's not removed yet. Then if that's the case, then they know that it's protected. Uh, on the remover side, they after they change something, they check the hazard pointers of, of any readers. And if it doesn't match, then say, OK, nobody uh, wants to protect it, and they reclaim it. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, uh, we don't need to get into details to get into that example. So this is a very simplified example that fits in one slide. And the difference from the LIFO push example is that the, the, um, the invalidation of the pointer or the pointer becomes a zombie uh, in user code. So it's kind of the argument to say, let the library handle it. That's, that's actually a, a counter example for that. So in a, in a, um, you can see this simplified that we're, we don't do memory order or any, any of this stuff. Um, so here's just like you have a root pointing to a block of type foo, and um, the updater will I look, you know, I look. Uh, it has a new a new block, and it will store the new block, and you know, hand off the the old one to the hazard pointer library to take care of like rep, you know reclaiming it when when it is uh, safe to do so when no readers are pointing to, to that block. Uh, on the other side, the, the readers, um, they, they have a hazard pointer. They read the root. And then they call the library, the hazard pointer library, with try protect. Again, this is kind of, there are alternatives in, in the hazard pointer library for this. But for, for the sake of a simple example, we're using the try protect interface. And try protect, it, what it does, it will try to read the root again, what, whatever that the atomic pointer. Uh, and read it and it finds it matches the pointer that is given by the user code. If it does, then it says, okay, great, where, you know, it, it actually set the hazard pointer internally. You can see that in the library code. Uh, and it says, great, where, you know, go ahead. If it succeeds, it's protected. Um, if it fails, then it updates the pointer with, uh, I mean, actually, in, in either case, it updates the pointer with the, the value read from the source. So anyway, that, that's kind of what it does. And you can see the simplified library code. Um, so we're going to go through a sequence of events that actually shows that uh, the zombification of the pointer, of the user pointer, happens in user code. And um, um, that, that's kind of something that's really difficult for a library to, to deal with, because it happens before even calling the library. So let's start with uh, root pointing to block A of type foo. Um, user code is doing a read. And OK, so it's already you know, uh, initialized the hazard pointer. And now it reads the, the value, the address of A from root. So that's like the first step. No, no problem there. Um, and then it stops. And then thread 2 goes and you know, um, replaces 
replaces the root with, uh, with uh, to point to uh, block B, and now it has um, a. It's about to you know it removes it and retire. It retires it to the library. So now still pointer is is correct. I mean it's valid. It's pointing to uh, the valid block uh, A, but it's not uh, A is not protected uh, so far. Uh, now it's let's continue this sequence of events. And, and now the hazard pointer library checks the hazard pointers. It's not, uh, uh, A is not protected, so it reclaims it as it, as it should. And now um, t thread one's pointer becomes, you know, zombie. I mean, it could be in, in, in real implementation so far, the compilers don't, you know, leave it as it is. And, you know, it has a valid value that, that would compare to the edges of A. It's fine for now, but who knows in future compilers, they might do something to that pointer. Um, so it's kind of, that's where it becomes a zombie. Um, now we go back to uh, user code and it does the, um, it calls the, the has a pointer library. So now it's kind of, it's already a zombie before calling the library. The next step is, is we go into the library try protect code. And what it does is, I mean, it reads, um, it reads the value from PTR to a local variable P, and that also, who knows what value it gets. Is it, is it the same or a different one? In current implementations, it's still valid, but that's kind of just uh, uh, because compilers are not as aggressive that they could be allowed by the standards, uh, C and C++. Um, and now, it, okay, the, we go through the algorithm and or the code, and uh, we set the hazard pointer again. That can be anything, and and now thread two, or it could be thread three, or you know any other thread. It doesn't have to be thread two, but for the sake of, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it reallocates the block from A into a new a new uh, block C that just ha happens to have the same address as A. And um, it sets the root to point to C, again, the same address as A. And of course, thread ones, all these pointers in, users, in, in the user uh, function and in the library, uh, they have all these you know, uh, zombie pointers. And now we get back to the thread ones library code. Um, it will, uh, it will uh, load the address um, and that will be the address of C from root. And it will compare it with the value um, in, uh, so yeah, it will, re it will written PTR. So now PTR becomes valid. That's according to this code. I'm gonna have a, a variant in, in a minute. Um, but anyway, so now PTR is valid, but then P is, is still like zombie. It, it may succeed, the comparison may or may not succeed. In current implementations, it does succeed. Uh, so now we have, we tell the user that, hey, it's a, uh, uh, you can dereference PTR and it's protected by hazard pointer. Whereas we, we don't, with this implementation and with the current standard, that wouldn't be guaranteed. So that, that's an example. Any, um, I went through this, but if anybody has questions as, as I went through this, uh, okay. All right. So yeah, the, the point I want to make is that the the pointer zip happened in between these two steps that are highlighted or in bold uh, in user code, and there is not much the library could have recovered, uh, tried to recover from that with whatever casts or anything that even even the standard if the standard allowed that. Uh, in, in the future, that's not enough to, um, to not burden user code with kind of unintuitive, you know, casts or require them to use this kind of wrapper type or, uh, you know, things, tricks like that. We, we want user code to be, you know, concurrent, concurrent code to be as simple as possible. Um, now I'm going to go to a, a slightly different example based on this. Uh, where the deref we can dereference a, a zombie pointer. Let's just say the library, so this is the code that I presented a few minutes ago. Uh, let's just make a, a small change. And instead of loading from source into PTR, that's like the user's 
uh, pointer, we're just going to compare with it. So we're, we're going to compare with the value in P and say, oh, it, it, if it succeeds, uh, true. So PTR is not overwritten. This, this, is like, this is not what we do today in the library, but we, you know, someone could have written that code. So it, it is kind of uh, going back many years. And I mean, all this, all this concurrent code that was written before even um, concurrency was actually officially allowed in the C, C and C++. There were like decades of concurrent code in, written in these languages. Uh, so with this example, um, let's let's kind of fast forward from what I showed before. Let's let's get to the point where the root points to C and thread ones, um, all these all these uh, local variables are just like became zombie already. And instead of re uh, overwriting PTR, we we just do a comparison of the address of C with the value in the local pointer P, and that's a zombie. And uh, the, it happened to be originally pointing to block A that happens to have the same address as block C. And that comparison may succeed. And if we're using this library code, we would return true to the user. And the user would be um, would assume that it's safe to dereference uh, PTR. And now we have even. Uh, a worse situation, which is kind of would, would kind of match the provenance problem that Paul alluded to, uh, and we have we have kind of referenced at the end. If, if someone wants to read more about that, uh, but basically this is something we dealt we could deal in with in the library today. So we have a li we control the library. We we, we dealt with that, uh, but it's just like as a, again that's code that could uh, could be out there, um, and I'll hand it to Michael. Um, to have more examples and, and talk about solutions for a change. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, oh. OK, so it's, uh, it's time to turn this on. Yep. Turn. All right. So I'm going to um, talk about the use cases and bring us back to, from the cognitive overload you just experienced from looking at all the concurrency examples to a single-threaded use case, OK, and the C++ standard committee solutions that we're debating about. Now, I have to say that much of this, this work is based on Peter Sewell's paper. He's a professor at Cambridge University. Though he has, he's a man that well-respected in the, in the memory model ordering community. He has written more paper than I have ever read in my life. Okay? So if anything is wrong, it's not me. It's not my fault. <laughs> okay, so, so why should you care? Right? Well, it turns out that this is not just a concurrency example. Every even single threaded mode can have similar issues. And so here I'm going to show you a normal use of realloc. Okay? And the realloc C library, I know that is, I'm not supposed to use the word C in this conference, but the realloc C library um, function might or might not return a pointer to a fresh allocation. And software legitimately needs to know the difference. For example, without the ability to compare a pointer to a lifetime end ended object, the, mal the, the realloc function becomes rather hard to use. And one approach to, is to cast the pointers to either an in pointer or an unsigned in pointer okay, before comparing them. But not all current compilers res respect these kinds of casts. It came from the compiler community, and this is, this is what happens. So in addition, what happens is that the casts have the disadvantage of, having, of disabling pointer type checking. And it would therefore be good to permit pointer uh, load, store, and comparisons aspects in cases like this one. Um, so if the allocated region itself contains pointers to within the region, fixing those up after the realloc becomes even more challenging. Okay. So some WG14 members have suggested things like splitting realloc into a tri-realloc and things like that. Was that explanation more, more clear? No. <laughs> let me go to it and even, let me hammer the point home even more. This is a point of provenance example in one of Peter Sewell's paper. All the references, incidentally, at the back. Okay. So, C pointer values are typically represented at runtime as simple concrete numeric values. Now, we know that. But mainstream compilers routinely exploit the information about the provenance of pointers, the reason that they cannot alias. Provenance in this context means where they come from. Okay. They can actually track these kinds of things, as well as their aliasing values. And 
has, so they do this, and I worked on a, the, the, the XLC++ compiler for many, many years, 25 years, We do this to justify optimizations, all in the name of optimization. So consider this classic case here on the left. So the test is, and the, it depends on the implementation what the results are gonna be, and you'll see the results on the right. So X and Y in this case, Y is assigned two, X is assigned one, and X and, y, X and Y might in some execution happen to be allocated in adjacent memory. That's the key. In that case, the address of X plus one and the address of Y will have bitwise identical representation values. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay. And the mem compare will succeed, and then P derived from a pointer to X will have the same representation value as a pointer to a different object Y at the point of the update of star P equals 11. I love this example because this really crystallizes where the zombie pointer is, because, and this can occur in practice. And what happens is that the result is that when GCC 8.1, we test it, and you get X at O2 optimization, you get X equals one, Y equals two, star P is 11, and star Q equals two. On the Intel compiler, version 19, at O2 optimization again, you get X equals one, Y equals two, star P equals 11, and star Q equals 11. It's getting closer. <laughs> On the Clang 6.0 compiler, at O2 again, you have X equals one, Y equals 11, great, finally. Star P is 11, star Q is 11. As expected, what most of you would think. Okay. I want to point out that there's no type, no type, there's nothing under my sleeve. There's no type-based aliasing involved here, and I haven't turned on GCC's F no strict aliasing option, which you think would actually be the thing that would actually fix this. And that I can assure you that at that address x plus one, um, being one pass a pointer, is explicitly permitted by the ISO standards. Okay. So. What do we do about this? So that's just one single threaded example. There are actually quite a lot, surprisingly. This exploded in the C committee about, I don't know, nine months ago, I think. And people just talk everywhere, just, do, just, go, just went all over the place with this. So this just lists some of the, some of the, some of the, um, the, the single, other th single threaded case. So even if you're not interested in concurrency, if you're using the pointer to a newly freed object as a key to a container data structure, this would enable further cleanup actions that's enabled by the free. If you're doing debug printing of the pointer, that could happen. If you're debugging code that caches pointers to recently freed objects, this could happen. Uh, some garbage allocators might need to load, store, and compare possibly indeterminate pointers as part of their mock sweep pass. And in, in a, in, if a pair of pointer is my alias, now we're getting to the provenance, the simplest code would free one, check to see whether the pointers are equal, and then if not, free the other. And then finally, you might have a loop freeing the elements of a linked list, which might check the just free pointer against null as the loop termination option. Now in the paper, they also have a reference blog post, they reference a, a blog post that suggests to use a break statement to avoid such a comparison. So it seems that we need to solve this problem, whether you're interested in concurrency or even single threaded cases. So I'm gonna go through and walk through the possible solutions that's in C. Except wait, this is a C++ conference. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna do it for C++ instead. It's interesting that the C++ solution is basically the C solution plus two more in red that I want to highlight, okay? And I'm gonna give some opinion, or actually this is our collective opinion of, I, of my co-conspirators here, about why we think each solution is either good or bad, and maybe we can get some help from you guys as to whether you agree with this. All right, so let's start with the status quo. So this is, of course, the resolution that results from leaving the st standards alone. This would leave unstated the ordering relationship between the end of an object's lifetime and the zapping of all the pointers to it. And this is gonna also result in practitioners continuing to apply the de facto workaround or AKA solutions, okay? And in fact, 
a number of large pre c 11 code, uh, concurrent code bases, including the Linux kernel, okay, and prominent user space applications avoid these issues for pointers to keep allocating objects. How do they do that? Well, what they do is they, they carefully refuse to tell the compiler which functions do memory allocations or the allocations at all, okay? And at the current time, uh, this prevents the compiler from applying any pointer lifetime NZAP optimization. Beautiful. I get, I get what I want. But I have to magically lie to the compiler. That is, in essence, what this means. Now, this also has the effect that this could prevent the compiler from applying any pointer lifetime NZAP optimizations. But it also prevents diagnostics um, that might be useful um, as a result of this based on the point of lifetime and analysis that it might do. So of course, this approach might need some adjustments in time, because as we know, um, whole program analysis is constantly marching forward, okay? And it's becoming more common. Um, my old XLC compiler had link time, had whole program analysis, okay? Um, GCC has link type optimization capabilities that are, but so with these kinds of increased optimizations, these old practices might start breaking. So this is why the committee, the community, is so up in arms about trying to do something about this. Let's look at the other end of the spectrum, the opposite solution. That is totally eliminate point of lifetime ends up. Okay. I'm wondering, I'm looking at you guys thinking, do you guys want to see what the audience thinks? Or maybe we should look at, do, do it after, and once they've seen all the solutions. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is the opposite then. Let's do it after the, the you've seen all five solutions, okay? So keep, it, keep this in mind, okay? So given that ignoring point of lifetime ends up is common practice among sequential C developers, another solution is to reflect that status quo in the standard by completely eliminating pointer lifetime end. Is that? I have to keep saying that together. So this is, of course, also going to eliminate the corresponding diagnostics and optimizations. So it's therefore worth looking into more nuanced changes because we might not want to eliminate um, these kinds of additional diagnostics and optimizations. So this is what's going to come following these first two basic solutions, I call them. Now, this, the, these solutions are not particularly, um, but this particular solution is not particularly bad. In fact, we think it's actually reasonably good. You do lose all those defensive null checkings. The previous solution, the status quo, just to remind you, we think it's bad because existing code obviously might start breaking once um, optimizations become more aggressive. Okay. So let's start going through the nuanced solutions. 3.8 says, so this one is talking about limiting, so all of the following talks about limiting that life point of lifetime ends up in some way or another. So they're, they're, they're all the same. And they're, they're, uh, those are the next three cases. So this is now limiting based on storage duration. So the concurrent use cases for pointers, the lifetime ended um, objects, seems to involve only allocated storage duration objects. But the, con but the current compiler nulling of pointers at lifetime end appears to only be concerning with automatic storage durations objects and maybe um, thread local objects as well. So the idea there is used to, to leverage this, and the biggest advantage of this approach is that it accommodates all the known concurrent use cases, and also many of the single-threaded use case. Someone should ask me what's the one that it doesn't accommodate, and Paul's gonna answer. So there is some concern that this particular solution might limit future compiler di diagnostics or optimizations, but we don't know the future, so let's, keep, let's, let's watch along and see what happens. There is, of course, a similar level of concern about point of lifetime NSAP in validating other algorithms that we don't know about, just like what Paul demonstrated from back in 1973. This is why we have a, such a large committee. So one can also imagine doing this selectively Okay, but we'll talk about the selective using annotations in the next solution. So this particular one we think is good. Um, I don't know, we think this is the best one, but it seems consistent with programming and compiler practice. Okay, got it so far? All right, let's keep going. The second of three limiting, li limiting the lifetime ends up. 
Now, this one is based on pointer loads with C11 atomics or inline assembly. Okay. We don't want to name names, but, but because we don't know if this solution was actually preferred by the person who suggests this. Maybe they, people suggest solutions all the time when they might not like it. But we do this just to throw it out, just to see what people think. So a WG21 SG12, which is the committee that deals with this, they deal with um, undefined behaviors as well as safety critical issues. A member suggested that pointers loaded using C11 atomics or inline assemblies be exempted from pointer lifetime ANZAP. And then we did some further investigation into, the, into existing code, and this prompted we uh, us to add things like volatile loads and stores uh, to be added to this list. Now, this approach would accommodate all the verified concurrent use cases that we know of, but there is some concern over lock-based algorithms um, involving pointer revalidation, thinking about it, because the pointers are accessed um, with the locks held, and they might well be accessed, um, they might well be accessed using plain C loads and stores. So it also requires adding language to define the information flow to the standard. This is always one of the most challenging aspects of, of putting that kind of things in the standard. <clears throat> because you, to do it, because you, you want to do it to identify all this, all this point to instances. This is usually complex and require a lot of decisions analogous to provenance versus integer semantics. Now, for this particular solution, we think it's both good and bad. It's unclear whether it covers all the cases, and we would need to obviously <coughs> define this, this compiler information flow to figure out where all the, pointer, all the pointer instances are flowing from. Okay. And I would point you to um, Mr. Consume <laughs> and the story of Consume for this kind of, of, of compiler information flow tracing. Okay. So we've had bad experience with these kinds of things before. Now 3C is talking about limiting the lifetime of pointer end step based on mocking pointers. And this uses one of my favorite features that I put in C++11, generalized attributes, or something similar. I have to put that up. <laughs> so a WG14 member suggested using, adding a new mocking, okay? Uh, and then a SG12 WG21 member also suggested using something like Stuart Launder, okay? Uh, now, these approaches would work well for new code that you can annotate, but not particularly great because old code would not have such annotation. <laughs> um, so maybe we're going to have to need some combination. Okay. And frankly, to be honest, with or without the new marking, this approach should have minimal effect on compiler optimizations and diagnostics. Um, Peter Sewell further notes, however, that functions to which pointers are passed cannot tell um, whether those pointers were initially loaded via a, mocked uh, via a mocked access. So that's a bit of a problem there. Compiler would probably need to provide, compiler vendors would probably need to provide some sort of option for you to opt out of this. So our, our evaluation, our score on this is that we think this is not a great solution. There's no practical way, we think, to find all the code, and you would have to do a fair bit of work. The fourth one, 3D, is limiting pointer lifetime end zap based on pointers crossing function boundaries. So a WG14 member suggested that developers should be free to load, store, cast, and compare indeterminate pointers within the confines of a function, especially one that is either whether it's inlined or otherwise. But that Touching indeterminate pointers that have crossed the function boundary, however, should be subject to pointer lifetime end zapping. You don't like that? Because <laughs> I noticed you made a face, Anthony. Anytime <laughs> Anthony makes a face, I have to check. <laughs> so this proposal could be combined with the other proposals, and our collective opinion is that this is probably bad. So you can relax. <laughs> the hazard pointer um, example that Maggot went through, in particular, shows really well that it's a big, it's a big, big restriction going in this this direction. 
I got about 10 minutes left, so I've got only two more solutions to go through. Okay, so these are the solutions that, is, that did not go through C. We think that they could work in C++ with some, well, let's take a look at them. One is zap only those pointers that are passed to delete and similar. Okay, so pointers actually passed to the allocators, for example, in delete P or the pointer P might become invalid. But there are other copies of that pointer. Even those within the same functions are unaffected. Now the problem with this one is that it's okay because you do get some protection, um, but it's bad we think is that because delete is an operator and compiler can do whatever it wants with these kinds of operators. The problem, this, it, the problem that with this is that this is a solution, yes, we know it can work in C, and it can be work in C++, but it's really a kind of a constructed solution because what you do, it's just barely doable in C++. Because this is still bad in that you have to do a lot of difficult, a lot of difficult things with debugging such, such a constructed pointer. Okay? So you might want to keep track of the pointers that are recently free to do things with them so that when you do Q equals P, you do delete P, for instance. So delete is an operator, but in the C language, free is a function. And then we think that that's one of the reasons why this would be bad. The last solution is to store all the pointers as integers, okay? Now, you can do this in C, but it's, you can do it more transparently in C++ with some sort of an operator overload that's wrapped inside of a structure. And then you can overload the dot and then the arrow operator. And this would work, but the problem is that we still require user code now to adapt to this structure with all these operator overload. Yes, I grimaced at this one too, because it's a lot of cognitive overload, we think. And we have to make the user jump through hoop to use it. So our evaluation is that this is not great. Okay. But hey, we want, to, we want to do a brain dump and see where it goes. Because this is what you got to do when you want to present the committee with a solution. You never know which one will work. So let's go to finally defending um, your, what, what, what advice can you get out of this talk. And we've gone through a lot of covered wide range. You always want to walk away with something that you can do to help your code so that you can do something better. So we want to talk about defending your code from zombies, some zombie pointers. We are trying to change the standard, and in this case, we're going to try to synchronize the change in both C and C++. But in the meantime, but as you know, these kinds of things take a long time. It would probably take conservatively anything from a year to three years before something like this would actually change. But in the meantime, let's see what you can do. So we advise that where possible, and we understand you might, that might not always be possible, um, try to hide your allocation function from the compiler. The Linux kernel has a lot of examples of doing this. You might want to use non-standard extensions like inline assembly to keep the compiler in the dark and the zombies buried. When you're writing new code, you have to use defensive programming. You want to keep this possibility in mind when you're chasing obscure pointer bugs. You might want to inform us of additional valu valuable use cases so that we can justify why we want to ch change this in the standard. And finally, we want to have a call to arms to tool vendors, people who are writing sanity tools, um, to detect these zombie pointers in existing code. They may not be able to fix it, but they might be able to do a decent job of detecting it. We don't think anybody is trying to do that. So with that, that I'm going to invite my my co-conspirators up to answer the questions that I can't. There are references to, in particular, the DR, as well as the WG14 paper and, a w, and an upcoming WG21 paper <coughs> that essentially illustrates these kinds of use cases and solutions. Thank you very much. Uh, is this working? I actually have two questions. Um, my first question is, like you said yourself, right? Like everything, all of this is in the name of optimizations, yeah. right? But do we have any, like you mentioned the first solution, which was like just to delete this lifetime pointer in Zap from the standard, right? Which would disable some That's of these the optimizations. Second one, yeah. yeah, second one. But no, well, nobody's counting. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like how important are these optimizations in practice? Like are there actual studies done on like critical algorithms that say like this is going to really hurt somebody? Um, I haven't seen any evidence that they're violently important. Uh, the, usually what comes up are the diagnostic uses. For example, if you, if in, it, it, this came up in the, in the context of WG14, so I'll give the C example, besides I'm a C programmer, so what can I do? Uh, you do free of P, and then you do return P. 
or you take, a, take an address of a local variable and you return that address. Um, and uh, those diagnostics are valuable, but we would like some way of, and that's kind of why we, we took one, some of the solutions we do. We'd like to avoid throwing out the baby with the bathwater, but we'd like to change something. So would we still like, because my second question was actually specifically about the diagnostics, where, where I was going to say, like, if you remove this idea of lifetime pointer ends up from the standard, then what is there to really diagnose? Um, but well, uh, the, the one that seems to me the most valuable is if, I, if you take a, an address of a local. And this, you can could, you could change something and, and do this by mistake pretty easily, you can imagine. And then you return that address, the previous example. Um, what some of the compilers will do right now is they'll return null. Now, me, I'd prefer them to give me a warning, but uh, it is easier to notice a dereference of a null pointer later. That usually yells as opposed to you know, mess messing with something that's in an entirely different stack frame later on. They could still diagnose that, right? Like, I, I would prefer the diagnostic. But I mean, even if we remove it from the standard, right? Like this, yes, you can. There's no technical reason why it could there, there's, there's no, no shortage of warnings and diagnostics for things that are totally legal C and C++, right? So yes, I agree with you completely, if that's yeah, your point. Yeah, number two seems like the best one to me, but. Uh, yeah, um, w, um, SG12 in C++ agrees with you. Hi there. Um, just going to first of all put down my vote for B as in the second one for probably odd and esoteric reasons. Um, my concern here or thoughts circle around have we thought about how this would interoperate in a world where stood bless or something similar has actually made it through and we're dealing with pre-held memory arenas. I'm not sure I'm not confident that it's just dynamic. I'm thinking memory arenas that we control could possibly be used the same way. And in fact, in my, from my viewpoint, we actually want to do that, but I know that's unpopular. Well, one, uh, uh, one thing that can happen if you have a stood bless um, is that, so let's, let's go back to my original algorithm, the one that had the zombie pointer. You could easily imagine saying stood bless of this thing each time for the loop and you know, life would be better, except that it could still zombie right after the stood bless. I mean, I do, uh, so yeah. I'm, I'm in the middle, I, I've got an LSC assembly language thingy and I'm in the middle of that. And I've just, I'm just about to do the compare exchange. The stood bless already happened. And then I wait and all the stuff happens again and I'm in a zombie again still. So it, there are some algorithms, don't get me wrong, where that would work just fine, but I can give you examples where, where it just narrows the window of zombiness. Which may well be an argument against what I'm hoping for, which is a stood bless that is wider than what's trying to get to be specified. <laughs> stood bless the variable for all time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then we get back to having to trace the, the, yeah. the uh, yeah. control Seven. flow. I, I miss, you said you wanted to, you, want, you prefer solution number two or three B? Which one? Oh, sorry, three uh, B. 3B, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This might be a time to ask people, do you have any particular thought about which solution you might like? You can vote. I'd like to go through it because this will help us gather data for the committee paper. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So you can vote for more than one, obviously. Um, and we're just going to do ask, ask the vote for, for you know, whether you really like this solution. Who likes one? Status quo. No change to the standard. Let's call that a zero. I'm writing them down. Yeah. <laughs> There'll we'll be a call, test later. We'll call the EW chair to moderate if, you, if, if it's becomes controversial. <laughs> Number two, you want it, we, we should eliminate point or lifetime ends up altogether. Okay, I'm going to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight. This is what we do in the C++ standard. We actually have to look to, and sometimes rooms have mirror, and I, I'm on to you if you guys, you guys try to put one hand out and then, then make it count as two. <laughs> all right, 3A. So this is all, A, B, C, and D are all limiting point of lifetime ends up based on storage duration. Oh, question? Oh, you're already voting. Okay, 3A, based on the storage duration. One, two, three, okay, three. 
limit it based on by exempting pointers loaded using C11 atomics or inline assembly from lifetime ends up, and by extension the volatile loads it stores, right? So I see one, two for three B. 3C, marking of pointer fetches using some kind of an attribute, for instance, or stood launder. Zero. It's, it's marked as bad, so nobody celebrates <laughs> it. <laughs> Sometimes people like to be bad, you know, or maybe we think it's bad and you've got some other thing, you know, if, if you know. 3D, um, only for pointers crossing function boundaries. None. And four, do you guys want me to go through four and five? Why not? All right, just do it. Zap only those pointers past the delete and similar. Zero. Zero. Store all pointers as integers. No. <laughs> <laughs> you, we, you already do that anyway, don't you? <laughs> I think that's a zero. Okay. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much. This is really helpful. I think this is actually, thank you for participating in the committee process. Cheers, guys. <laughs>